Hi, I'm Calivan. We live in the era of the dawn of AI, where applications that use concepts such as machine learning and natural language and vision processing are now being made available to us. These applications aren't just limited to productivity or creativity. DeepMind is working on what it calls a reinforcement learning agent for tackling StarCraft II. Essentially, it's an advanced AI bot that can play StarCraft II at a grandmaster level, making it better than more than 99% of human players. This bot, called AlphaStar, isn't alone, there are a few, and they aren't just limited to StarCraft II. What we casually refer to as AI in older RTS games is nothing of the sort. So let's take a look at how our computer opponents worked before modern AI started to get involved, so we can better understand the differences we might start to see in the future. First off, I want to give recognition to Tommy Thompson, who wrote an in-depth article on the AI of Command and Conquer when the source code was released back in 2020. Without that article, this video would be seriously lacking in concrete examples, so I've linked to it in the description because it's an interesting read. Modern AI systems make an attempt to replicate intelligence. They are focused on observing, learning and achieving results by repetition. They are designed to adapt to new information and circumstances using information already learned from previous lessons. The computer opponents in RTS games were never designed to do this. They are more of a simulated intelligence rather than an artificial one. So when we use the term AI to discuss an opponent in Red Alert or Company of Heroes, what we really just mean is the computer opponent. These computer opponents are essentially a script that follows a predefined set of rules. Think of them like a huge flowchart with a fixed set of conditions and if-then logic. Every so often, they take all of the input available to them, such as the size and position of the enemy force and the state of their own units and resources, and then put that into their own flowchart. This equation produces a result which is translated into build, move and attack orders, which the computer opponent then executes. The Command and Conquer AI, which is also the basis for the Red Alert and Tiberium Sun AI, is heavily state driven. In very simple terms, this means there are lots of values scattered all through the game code that allow the computer opponent to determine what condition everything is in. Let's examine how this might work in a theoretical example. Our computer opponent has a script that runs every few hundred milliseconds that examines each of its units and buildings one after another. When the script completes, it waits a little and then runs the same script again. The computer owns a construction building, a resource processing building, a collection unit and a combat unit. Firstly, it runs the AI script for the construction building. This is a complicated one, but the first check it makes is just to see if it has any resources. In our easy example, it doesn't, so it skips the rest of the checks and moves on to the next asset, the resource building. This building cannot do anything itself, so it has one simple check. Is it at full health? It is, so it skips it and moves on to the next asset, the resource collector. It checks to see if it's currently collecting resources, which it's not, so it issues the collection order. Finally, the script checks in on the combat unit. The first check is to see if its harvesters are under attack. This is currently false, so it moves on to the next check in the priority list, which just asks how many other combat units it has. It's less than five, so it issues a guard order to this particular combat unit so it remains at the base. Later in the game, we instruct one of our own units to attack the enemy resource collector. Our unit moves and makes an attack, removing some health from the target. This triggers a state change, so that the value of the variable harvesters are under attack shifts from false to true. The next time the AI runs through its checklist and arrives at the combat unit, it will run the same check as before. However, this time, harvesters under attack is now true, so it issues a move order to take the combat unit to the position of the harvester to protect it. This is a vast simplification of the system, but it does demonstrate the decision-making process of computer opponents in older games. Each computer-controlled player in Command & Conquer is referred to as a house. They are independent of each other, so if you're playing a mission or a skirmish with multiple computer players, friend or foe, they think independently. There are two types of AI rules within Command & Conquer, missions and strategies. Missions are instructions given to individual units, such as attacking, guarding or harvesting. Strategies are on a grander scale, and govern decisions such as what buildings and units should take priority and when to attack the enemy. The house examines the current state of the game to determine if a certain strategy is suitable or not, using various pieces of information available to it, such as the number of units it owns. It could be as simple as this. 
When my unit number is greater than 10, issue attack missions to 5 of my units. Those units will then follow the logic written within those attack missions, which normally involves moving towards the enemy base and shooting at the first thing they find. AI behaviour is something both computer and human controlled players will have to deal with. When you issue a move order to one of your own units, it will have to figure out exactly what steps to take to complete that order in a process commonly known as pathfinding. There are several algorithms available for this, with A-star pathfinding probably being the most popular option. These pathfinding algorithms work on a careful cost-benefit analysis of the distance and the terrain types that need to be crossed to compute the most sensible route to take. Let's say we wanted to move our unit from its current position to the X, and our game used the A-star pathfinding method. The map would be divided up into grids and it would plot the fastest course from our starting position to our destination. In this example, we have the same movement speed on every passable tile, so it would be pretty simple to plot. Now, let's say that in our game our units move significantly faster on roads. The game would provide all of this data to the pathfinding algorithm so it could properly evaluate the situation. It would then come up with the route that was cheapest in terms of travel time, even if it was technically further in distance. This is how the algorithm would see the map in terms of cost, not distance. In this example, the darker the tile is, the more costly it is to move there, which is why point B is actually closer than somewhere to the left of point A, due to the different move speeds on road. The full details of these pathfinding algorithms are well out of scope for this video, but if you want to know more then I recommend having a bit of a read up on A-star pathfinding, as it's a pretty interesting topic if you like that sort of thing. Anyway, these pathfinding algorithms are quite expensive calculations, and older computer systems just didn't have the chops to do a lot of these at the same time. Instead, Command & Conquer uses an alternative method called Crash & Turn. This is far cheaper in terms of processing, and simply moves the unit forward in a straight line towards the destination. If it encounters impassable terrain, it will work its way along that feature until it arrives at the first accessible spot still on its initial trajectory. Once there, it will rerun the straight calculation to continue the journey. If you've ever wondered why the pathfinding in Command & Conquer and Red Alert is so bad, this is why. It's not because the developers were dumb or lazy, it's because the limitations in early hardware forced them to make sacrifices in some areas so that you could have lots of units to play with. One thing Tommy Thompson notes in his article that I find quite interesting is how this sub-optimal method replicates the actions of a human player exploring an unfamiliar map. If you've played CNC, you'll probably remember that your units only uncover a very small amount of the fog of war as you begin to explore. This method of moving forward until you find an obstacle, and then following the edges of it until you can proceed, is probably what you did until you uncovered most of the map. The computer opponent in Tiberium Dawn has a total of 22 different missions that it can allocate to a unit. These include things like Guard, which has the unit hold a specific location and attack anything that comes nearby, Hunting, where it will move to attack enemies within a certain range, or even the much simpler mission of Do Nothing. Some of these missions are also conditional, where a unit who is currently on Do Nothing can switch to Hunting after it takes damage, and then go back to Do Nothing once it has not taken additional damage for a certain time. When deciding what strategies to employ, the house in Command & Conquer has five different states that it can be in. Build Up, Broke, Threatened, Attack and Endgame. These different states determine what construction priorities it has and what missions it prefers to assign to the units it controls. By default, it will sit in the build up state, in which it will continue to add new buildings and produce new units depending on what it has already on the field. There is a complex array of logic rules in place that govern this, including things like power and resource management so that it prioritises power stations if it's low on energy, and it doesn't build production facilities if it doesn't have the resources to actually make units from them. When faced with multiple enemies, the house will keep a tally of each other player's army value and proximity, and then use those figures to pick a primary target. It will continue to attack that target until it's destroyed, or until another player attacks it, in which it will switch its attention to that new player. If the house determines it's in an unwinnable position, it will switch to the endgame state, where it will sell all of its structures and then send all of its remaining units out to hunt. Because the house just follows a pre-designated plan, it can easily be bested by a human opponent. 
The computer opponent can be given additional rules and regulations to follow on different maps, which is why its behaviour does vary between one campaign mission and the next, but it's still following a predetermined plan. One thing that I will give the Command & Conquer AI is it doesn't really cheat. It does get full map vision, but in the original CNC, fog of war removal is permanent, so this isn't a huge advantage over a player. Apart from that, it has to harvest and spend resources in the same way a human would, it requires just as much power for its buildings, and it gets no free units nor any production cost or time reductions. The house in Command & Conquer is a perfectly serviceable computer opponent for an early RTS game. It provides everything needed for a challenging single player campaign, and a good starting point for a newer player to learn the features of the multiplayer game. When paired with one or more other computer opponents, it can be a challenge in skirmish mode too, where its predictability and other limitations can be partially reinforced by raw numbers. Many of the games that followed the Command & Conquer series did have significant improvements to the scripting used by the computer opponents. More detailed and complex rules were added that allowed them to better respond to the game state, and when this wasn't enough, the developers often tried to bridge the gap by giving the computer extra advantages, such as additional resources or faster tech progression. However, these processes, commonly referred to as cheating by the community, are generally frowned upon as they don't provide the human player with an experience that feels genuine. Many games, such as Age of Empires 2, had a dedicated community of modders who have tried to create their own improvements to the AI of the game, providing a greater challenge with more complicated script and predetermined build orders to better replicate a human opponent. These efforts and their results are impressive, but they are still based on the same sort of decision making. The AI in early RTS games, and I think many or all of the recent ones too, is not really what we'd call an artificial intelligence today. They have no real awareness, they are unable to learn from anything that they have previously experienced, and they can only respond in ways that have been specifically designed by the creator. These simulated intelligences follow a predetermined checklist of tasks, and execute those tasks when the correct parameters are met. They might follow a fixed set of rules, but this does not mean they always lack potency. The computer opponent might have a set plan, but it's still a plan nonetheless, and unlike a human opponent, it doesn't get singularly focused on one part of the battlefield, nor does it get annoyed or impatient, and it doesn't respond emotionally to a frustrating loss. However, things are changing. If Alpha Star is anything to go by, then the computer opponent in strategy games of the future could be a very different beast to what we've been used to in the last 30 years. Who knows, they might even develop self-awareness and let me win the odd battle out of pity. Hi there, thanks for letting me subject you to today's lesson. If you've got any thoughts on anything I've discussed, then please let me know in a comment. If you enjoyed this video, then click the like button, and if you want to appease our new machine overlords, then consider subscribing to my channel.